This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. This week, Mike Barron talks about switching from writing comics to writing novels, the importance of humor in any kind of story, the current status of his long-running characters Nexus and Badger, and more. First, I'd like to thank our patrons for keeping this show going. Join them at patreon.com slash deconcomics. If Patreon isn't in your budget, you can also send a one-time donation of any amount via PayPal to donate at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. All right, uh, I'm on the line with Mike Barron in Colorado. How are you doing? Good. Here to talk about, well, partly about the novel you just put out, but of course I've got Nexus questions. Um, but uh, first of all, um, maybe let's kind of start before all that. Uh, what kind of comics did you read as a kid? Oh, uh, Uncle Scrooge is the first one I had uh, a vivid memory and I credit Carl Barks with inspiring me to a certain degree to be a writer. And then when I was in college, some friends of mine showed me the Steranko Nick Furies and uh, the Neil Adams Avengers, and that's when I got real serious about it. I see. And so then did you start making your own comics when you were a kid? Oh, no, 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 no. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get serious about writing and until after I graduated from the university. Uh, but I, it was always in the back of my mind, uh, mm. and uh, especially because of John D. MacDonald, who's my main inspiration, and, and probably the reason I'm writing today is I picked up a John D. MacDonald, Travis McGee novel, um, The Deep Blue Goodbye, and as I was leaving the cigar store where I had purchased it for 50 cents or some ridiculous price, I, <laughs> I said, geez, this guy writes these books and I'm buying them. Uh, he must be making a living at it. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's where I got the idea. Okay. So uh, did, you, did you write anything before Nexus? Oh, yeah. Uh, I wrote for the high school newspaper in Madison, okay. Wisconsin, West High. And then after I graduated from the University of Wisconsin, I moved to Boston. And uh, I worked as a journalist for seven years. I wrote for the mm -hmm. Boston Phoenix, the real paper, the Boston Globe. I had a column in Cream. I wrote for Fusion, uh, We Magazine. Anybody who would uh, cross my palm was silver. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, was Nexus the first comic that you wrote? Not really. Uh, the very first comic I wrote was with Larry Gonick, who uh, uh, did the cartoon history of the universe. And it was called uh, Tie Tack, and it was uh, an underground effort, and uh, it's it's uh, justly forgotten. Uh, <laughs> but then uh, I moved back to Madison, Wisconsin. I met Steve Rude, and we did a comic together called Encyclopedias, which was really the first comic that that he and I did, the first mm. real comic. Uh, and that was later serialized in Pacific Presents, but but Nexus was the next thing after him. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, so as far as Nexus, um, I was rereading some of it, uh, getting ready for this, and um, it's interesting to notice how you know. Of course, you're. It was written about you know future far beyond where we are now. Um, and but of course the Soviet Union is already gone. <laughs> uh, well, and it's still, I don't know about that. Well, you could argue about. It. I mean, um, and then also the web turned out to mean something different than it does in Nexus. Yep. Um, but uh, were you uh, writing about the future? Uh, were you meaning to be predictive or just fun? I don't know about the predictive stuff. Uh, my number one rule is entertain. That's the mm -hmm. writer's job is to entertain. So I think that I was mostly interested in telling a good story, but we all bring our worldviews to what we write. And uh, Nexus reflected that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, the, Russia, as we call it today, is reeling. It, you know, it's barely a superpower. They've got all sorts of problems. But their activities haven't changed since the Soviet Union. Uh, they still operate in more or less the same way. It's mm -hmm. just there. I don't think they're they're the threat they used to be. 
but you know, I stand behind my uh, uh, prediction of the Saw of Empire. If they thought that they could get a, ahead by rebranding themselves the Soviet Union, they do it in a heartbeat. I'll get. To, I have some more Nexus questions later, but um, so I imagine as a writer, a lot of people probably ask you, "Where do you get your ideas?" <laughs> <laughs> well, like most writers, I subscribe to an idea service. It's very expensive, but it's worth it. <laughs> well, I I've tried to write fiction, but I often I just kind of sit and I can't figure out what to write. It'd be nice to have some ideas. I think maybe the que- better question is. Um, what do you do to get your creative juices flowing? Well, uh, a writer uh, deals in ideas just like a bricklayer deals in bricks. You've got to lay one brick down after another. So I generate ideas constantly. I'm always on the uh, lookout for a new idea. If I hear uh, an odd assortment of words, that will inspire me. If you see a, a, a news story, like a laboratory is now growing uh, uh, laboratory meat. There are mm-hmm. no animals involved. They're they're mm-hmm. taking animal cells and they're growing meat in the lab and they're going to serve that up and it's going to replace the steak or whatever. Uh, that's an idea for a science fiction movie right there. Yeah. Uh, story. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's a personality. You know somebody who's so outrageous uh, that uh, that they inspire thoughts about how did they get that way what are they going to do with their powers or whatever sometimes i just hear a, a title you know a title of a story will pop in my head just a little collection of words that goes together and uh one i'm playing with now is is the snot-nosed punk of yore the snot-nosed punk of yore that's the title but i haven't found a story yet <laughs> years, years ago i i um, my folks were telling me about this uh a uh, movie called The Trail of the Lonesome Pine. I think it starred Henry Fonda. And as a child, I transmuted that into my head in, into The Trail of the Loathsome Swine. Mm. And I carried that around with me for decades before I finally found the story. It's about a kid who lives in Georgia, Georgia whose sister is killed by a feral hog, and he goes hunting for the hog in the forest, and, and that became the story. Uh, but what I do do is I carry a notepad with me at all times and a pen, and I make notes constantly of anything and everything that might inspire me. Hmm. Yeah, I noticed in one of the more recent uh, Nexus stories, um, there was a, a thing about invasive species. I was kind of interested to see that in there, all the insects that showed up from who knows where. Yeah. So I imagine that was something you must have gotten from the news or or somewhere. Yeah, yeah, you know... Uh, uh, most of the stories are character driven but but they have to have strong ideas mm-hmm. for the characters to react uh, so it, whatever fits the story uh, we have so much nexus history now and and the world is so vast with so many characters and ideas that it's never really a problem to come up with new story ideas the more you write the more ideas they generate yeah, yeah. Well, when, once you kind of get the ball rolling, then new ideas kind of appear, don't they? Yeah. Um, now, I've, I've found for me, if I I'm now I'm podcasting all the time, I don't seem to get much written anyway. But when I do try to write, somehow I'm more comfortable writing a comic than a prose story. Um, and now you're kind, you've kind of switched here from comics to more prose. So I'm wondering if that was an adjustment for you to writing in that style where you don't have any pictures. Yeah, it was a huge adjustment. Uh, I always wanted to write novels ever since I was a little kid. Uh, comics came easy to me uh, because comic books are the most forgiving medium there are. You will buy you will buy a story in a comic book that you wouldn't buy in any other medium. Although movies are catching up with CGI and all that, and, and Superman is is the proof. Uh, 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 in no other medium could you introduce Superman and have people believe there's a guy from another planet flying around, but they did it. And, and Superman was around for for 50 or 60 years before they they turned him into a movie because they had to wait for the technology to catch up to the story. Uh, on the other hand, uh, comics are are very forgiving. Uh, and uh, you can present a story in a comic book that's so stupid and unentertaining that, that no one would give it the time of day in any other medium. 
uh, novels are much more difficult. It took me 30 years to learn how to write a novel. One of the reasons is I'm a slow learner. I admit to that. But when I got it, I got it. And and uh, now I'm more excited about my writing than ever. Uh, and I think the, the, the output reflects that, especially with these Josh Pratt novels. I'm finishing up the seventh Josh Pratt novel now. Mm. Wow. So, what what was difficult? What was the most difficult thing for you about switching to writing novels? Uh, it was learning to follow the story of getting rid of all my little babies and clever words, syllogisms, and stuff. Uh, because when you start writing, you want to show how clever you are, and you're always putting in little clever things and repartees and plays on words. They don't really belong in a story. You have to follow the story wherever it leads, especially the type of story I write, which is a thriller where the goal is to grab the reader by the throat on the first page and drag him into the narrative to the, to the point where he no longer is aware that he's sitting in a chair looking at words on paper, mm. but experiencing the story. And I think novels are the, the best medium for that, although movies can come close. Mm. Why, are, why are novels the best medium for that? Uh, because uh, a good writer creates a tunnel between the page and the reader that nothing else can penetrate. And if you've ever had a book you could not put down, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, you're following that story, and you want to know what happens next. And that's the, the crucial element to all fiction, in, in my opinion, is what happens next. Mm -hmm. uh, and a good writer is going to keep you breathless on the edge of your seat throughout the narrative. Mm, so are you are you completely switched over to novels there now? Oh, are no, you doing no, no, any no. comics? I, I love comics. I'm, I'm uh, working on a whole bunch of projects now, including a graphic novel adaptation of Sons of Bitches, uh, which we hope to... And that was one of your novels, right? Yeah, that's the fourth Josh Pratt novel. Okay. And we have a whole bunch of new Nexus in the works. Mm, okay. The Dark, the Dark Horse will publish. Okay, because um, the, uh, the last I have been able to find, I know you were doing some that were like newspaper size that Steve Rude was selling on his website. Yes, those are going to be the books, part of what Dark Horse is going to be publishing. Okay. Uh, and, and dude didn't know how to how to market or anything, and those 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 huge tabloid size. Uh, pages that he put out they're impossible to ship they're impossible to rack so mm. uh, he never really got traction with them yeah if it's not going out as a newspaper <laughs> it's kind of hard to find a way to sell it yeah I guess. yeah hmm. now i understand most of your novels have been well you said thrillers but uh horror or how how would you classify them exactly well uh, three are horror novels so i'm very proud of those and i love horror uh, and I, I will probably write more at some point, although uh, I'm concentrating on Josh Pratt now. The three horror novels are uh, Banshees, Scorpio, and Domain. And I suppose I should throw Helmet Head in there, too. Uh, but, and we're turning Helmet Head into a graphic novel as well. It'll work much better as a graphic novel. Uh, than as a novel, I think, because I, that was one of the earlier novels I wrote, and I'm just not that happy with the writing. But when you get to do a graphic novel of it, you can correct a whole bunch of of uh, errors. So let me just uh, tell you what they're about. Helmet Head is about a monstrous motorcyclist dressed all in black who rides the back ways of rural Illinois, cutting off the heads of other motorcyclists with his samurai sword. It's the legend of Sleepy Hollow with bikers. Mm. Banshees is about a satanic rock band that comes back from the dead, and I'm very proud of that one. It got a starred review in Publishers Weekly. It's the biggest novel I've ever read. It's epic. Uh, Scorpio is about a ghost who only appears under a blazing sun, and it follows the fate of a disgraced university professor as he tries to redeem himself in, in a... Uh, uh, an adventure that eventually leads him face to face with this monster. And Domain is the ultimate haunted house story. Okay, well, what makes it ultimate? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
well, it, it, there's a lot. Of, I think that that I pull it off really well, and my ego makes it ultimate. But <laughs> but, uh, but if you're familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, he's been inspiration to me in so many things in in my uh, fiction, and especially his son Lloyd Wright, who lived in L.A. And Lloyd Wright built a house it's called the Souden House. You can Google it: S O W D E N House, Souden House. Go take a look. Mm. Uh, and uh, there's a book called Black Dahlia Avenger about uh, uh, a former LAPD detective named Steve Hodell who figured out that his father was one of the most prolific serial killers in the United States and murdered the Black Dahlia. And he did it in the basement of Souden House. Uh, I don't know if the book is real. I, I mean, the, the book is absolutely real in, in – in, uh, in Steve Hodell's mind, and he's a trained detective, and he marshals and presents his facts in a very convincing way. It's very convincing, and I buy it. Some people don't buy it, but I do buy it. But when you couple that with this insane house that they lived in, and it provided a lot of inspiration for me, and I was able to use my my Frank Lloyd Wright character, Rourke Dexter Smith, whom I'd created <laughs> for, for uh, a comic book called The Architect, uh, so a whole bunch of things came together there. My love of architecture, uh, horror, uh, uh, the legend of this, this creepy old house, uh, the Black Dahlia murder. Uh, just uh, and it's also about the comic book industry as well. As the protagonist is a is a failed comic book artist who moves to L.A. to work in uh, storyboarding. Um, now, which which is your your latest book? Um, well, the latest one that's out is Sons of Bitches. Okay. And that's uh, about a, a young woman who puts out a Muhammad comic, and then she has to hire Josh to protect her. But mm -hmm. there will be two more Josh Pratt novels out by the end of the year. Uh, Buffalo Hump, which is about a charismatic Indian blues musician, and Bloodline, which is about uh, 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 cycle gangs and genetic engineering. Coming up, Clone Zone the Hilariator, mixing grimness and comedy, any hope of a Nexus movie, and more. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. We really appreciate your support. Tim and Paul race to the scene where a 1960s Batman TV episode needs analyzing. The casting of the show and its place in history. How the show approached gender and relationships. The writing, what's great and what's goofy. But don't be alarmed. Behind our masks, we're perfectly ordinary people. Tune in via iTunes or Stitcher. Or visit tothebatpoles.libsyn.com for... To the Batpoles. Yeah, so I I read another interview with you uh, where you ta said you were attracted to grim stories. Yeah, and you know, even in Nexus, there were certainly some grim parts of it. Um, but I when I th think of Nexus, for some reason, it's the humor that I always sort of remember that made it distinctive. Well, sure. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on balancing grimness and comedy in the story. Uh, well, uh, comedy belongs in every story. I don't care how grim it is, there will always be a, a touch of humor. Uh, even Schindler's List has a few jokes. But, but uh, you know, that's one thing you learn from Shakespeare. Uh, you read Macbeth or Hamlet, and there there are some real tossaway jokes because he was writing to please the crowd. Uh, and humor is a part of life. It's, it's a normal mm -hmm. and healthy part of life. And uh, it often rises as a reaction to something that we are – not prepared to deal with because it's so horrendous. It's it's a natural reaction, uh, like like uh, the thing. John Carpenter's The Thing. Remember that? Hmm. You know what I'm talking about? That movie? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, uh, they they see this thing running around on the floor that's like half a human head and and with these tentacles and stuff and and somebody makes some off offhand comment like what the hell is that but it's very funny but anyhow yeah humor belongs in every story it doesn't belong in every mm -hmm. line i mean you have to to leaven your mood and make it appropriate to the scene but 
uh, humor is a part of life and it's a part of uh, every story. Unless you're talking a short story. Short stories are only about one thing and you can write a straight short story with no humor whatsoever with a purpose to horrify. And you can write a whole novel that, that does nothing but horrify, like, like H.P. Lovecraft. But but I think H.P. would have done better to throw in a joke or two, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think if, if a story has... You know, if a novel or a movie has no humor in it at all, it's just not even quite realistic. Because there's, you know, yeah, you, like you said, even Schindler's List, you know, even in the grimmest situation, there, you know, people will make jokes to overcome the grimness. Yeah. Um, speaking of nexus and humor, um, I always loved uh, Clone Zone, the Hilariator. <laughs> um, now, is he, what, a, a Lizigator? Is that what he's? He's, he's a litigator. No, I, I just well, yeah, we don't know. You know, he's he's oh, you know, the reason the, the origin for that is lounge lizard. Mm-hmm. Lounge mm-hmm. lizard. And I thought lounge lizard is this guy that hangs around lounges and tries to entertain with bad jokes and and, uh, and so I describe him that way. So he's an anthropomorphic uh, alligator type thing that walks mm-hmm. on two legs. He's uh, a little based on Rodney Dangerfield. Uh, mm. But but uh, uh, Clone Zone will return in the new Nexus. Some of his best stuff ever. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. What what inspired you to to do so many uh, issue backup stories on a stand up comedian? That's sort of a <laughs> unique choice. I love the guy. I it just it just it just seems a natural to me. I'm fascinated by by showbiz and behind the scenes. Uh, I'm digging a show on Showtime right now called I'm Dying Up Here. It's about a bunch of comedians in the 70s. I just love it because it's it's so true to life. I mean, there's a, it's extremely funny and extremely sad. All these uh, comedians are so fucked up personally. They all have so many personal problems, and they're, they're always self-destructing, but they're always joking at each other's expense, and I just like that milieu. Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, when you write stories about a comedian, then you've got you've got to come up with the jokes for it. Yep, right? yep, yep, <laughs> yep. And that's uh, hard to do because I like situational humor. You know, I, I try to avoid puns and stuff, and but but uh, some are good. I mean, some are good. A man goes to the zoo. There's only one animal, a dog. It's a shit zoo. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the few I'll use. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, of course, on the grim side, I mean, you know, Nexus himself is not really a superhero. He's basically being blackmailed into killing mass murderers, right? Right. Um, and therefore, he's a murderer himself, but he seems like such a nice guy. So why did you decide to put him into such a moral gray area? Well, I think that's that's life. Uh, that uh, our greatest heroes aren't filled with certitude, but they have lots of self doubt, and they make decisions, courageous courageous decisions, and act accordingly. Originally, when uh, when Capital City asked me for a compelling superhero, I just said, "Well, you know, what makes for a compelling story? If somebody dies every time the hero shows up." that would be compelling and and that was <laughs> that was the origin of that but that's not a a, a startling uh revelation because all you have to do is is uh uh look at the titles of of uh, uh tv shows like scandal or uh homicide uh, hmm. they promise what they deliver uh <laughs> if you if you title your tv show Nice, boring people. It had better be. It had better be a satire, or else nobody's <laughs> going to tune in. And people tune in for drama. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, now, okay, I wanted to go way back to Black and White Nexus Three, the uh, flexi disc. 
um, the, you know, the, there was a phonograph record in it, right? That you could yeah. uh, listen to the soundtrack of the comic. How, how did that come about? Do you, do you remember? That was a long time ago. Well, it wasn't my idea. Uh, it was okay. just some fun. And I'm glad they did it. It gave those, it gave the guy that pulled it together something to do and was certainly refreshing. But, but my problem is, is the problem of anybody who loves a literary character is that when you read the book or you see, you read the comic, you assign in your head, uh, mm the voice you want that character to use. And, mm-hmm. and when the voice becomes real and it's not the voice in your head, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a little cognitive dissonance there. And they did a great mm-hmm. job. I just, I felt that the comics as a medium uh, should remain pure and that uh, it's up to the reader to supply the sound effects and the voices. Uh, if, you know, and the, the movies are a more complete experience, perfectly legitimate for the movies to cast somebody but then you have an actor using his whole body as well as his voice to impersonate that character. It's a much mm-hmm. more complete thing. So who were the who made it? Like who were the people on the record? Were they like professional voice actors well, or the one guy was I I don't know. I'd have to go back and look as that was 38 mm-hmm. years ago, you know. Yeah. And I got some I got one in the basement I think somewhere. I'd have to look up the credits. <laughs> hmm. Okay, I was just kind of curious about it. Um, so, but you've been working, uh, on Nexus with Steve Rude for quite a while now, um, more on than off, I guess. I mean, several different publishers, but, um, well, uh, what's, what's the the best thing about working with Steve Rude? Uh, well, uh, the way he brings, uh, uh, our vision to life, it's quite spectacular. Mm Mm-hmm. You've worked with other artists. I mean, has it been difficult to find an artist who gets what you want stuff to look like? I take it that Rude is one of the better ones at that. Well, we have our disagreements, uh, and I feel that that a number of stories would be better if he'd stick to my vision and make it <laughs> grim. But he's always he's a jokey kind of guy. He's always throwing in those Dr. Seuss type characters, and and sometimes they they come to the foreground and become major characters. Uh, but artists, uh, they fall all over the place. I got some artists who absolutely get it that I love to work with, such as Bill Reinhold or Vale Myerick. And I've worked with other artists who, who just don't get it, you know, and you can spell it out for them. Or, uh, <laughs> but but those are few and far between. And for the most part, I've been lucky enough to work with, with artists who, who uh, get in on the vision and understand what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Now, reading Nexus again, I was catching references that I didn't catch in the 80s. Um, it seems that uh, Yo-Yo Ma is sort of a battle cry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another one we did was, was as a sound effect when this, there's firing machine guns. It goes, Chaka Khan, Chaka Khan. <laughs> And uh, the story I read today with uh, Judah, somebody was calling out to him, yo, Jimbo. Yeah, yeah. Um, referring to the samurai movie. Right. Um, but then what really surprised me, was, um, in an issue from 1986, there's a character named Phonebone. And this is five years before Jeff Smith had published Bone, although I guess he was already working on the comic at that time was this just a coincidence no or? no no, no? It is because it was 15 years after don martin created freen bean j phone bone in the pages of mad magazine uh, okay 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 so that's that oh yeah that i remember that now yeah there was a don martin phone bone character right okay okay got it but yeah the, the first thing i thought of was jeff smith's stuff but Okay. Um, has there ever been any talk of a Nexus movie? Constantly. <laughs> Do you think it's ever going to get made? Um, I, you know, I don't want to jinx anything, but but uh, <laughs> there is a good chance it'll get made. Hmm. I mean, it seems like you know the time is you know now that comics are all over the movies, it seems like a, a natural next step. Yeah. Well, I would love to see it happen. And we have someone who's very interested in making it happen who can make it happen. So keep your fingers crossed. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Um, now, uh, Badger. Now, I was never much of a Badger reader, but um, I know that, that that's also sort of uh, been off and on. And I wasn't there 
a version just in the past year? Is that still going on? Three years ago, we put out a series from First Comics it's called The Battle of the okay. Five Wizards, and it's readily available. Uh, and I am working on some new Badger material now. Okay. I was looking at Comixology, and there's all kinds of Nexus there, but no Badger at all. Any idea why that is? No. I will bring that up with my publisher. Okay. Yeah, I guess I, I searched for Badger. I searched on your name, and I didn't see Well, anything. I'll be happy to send you some if you're interested. Um, yeah, sure. That'd be great. Um. So I, I was asking around for other people for questions for you. Well, my my brother remembered that in the late 80s, you were doing a lot of different comics, Flash and Punisher and a bunch of indie stuff. And he then he wondered if you got kind of burned out on all that or maybe he just, you just were under the radar a little bit after that. Well, I kind of fell into a 10-year period where I was just off the planet. It had a lot to do with my personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I went through some uh, grueling personal changes, and I moved from Wisconsin to Colorado. Uh, and because of all that, I emerged as a much better writer to the point where I can look back at a lot of the material I was doing in the 80s, and I just cringe, and I wish I could take it all back. Uh, but uh, the comics are like any other branch of the entertainment industry. If you fall off the rung of the ladder, there are 50,000 people there waiting to take your place. Um, and these days, I'd love to do more comics, but the big two, uh, you know, they, they just, they're not on my, I'm not on their radar, let me say. And I've pitched them countless times over the past 20 years, pitch after pitch. Sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't, but they bring in young editors whose knowledge of comics began yesterday, and the young editors hire their friends. And, and uh, except for those, those titans of the industry who have managed to uh, hold their career intact, I don't know how they do it. Well, I have an idea now, but it was too late to go back in time. So uh, I am seeking new venues for my, comic, my comics and, and new platforms, as a lot of us are. Uh, and I expect to be doing a lot more comics in the future, but uh, uh, many of them will be crowdfunded and self-published simply because I can't get traction at, at uh, the traditional publishers, uh, especially the mid-level publishers. They are loath to, uh, to hire uh, a creative team for a creator-owned concept, uh, you know, uh, because uh, the sales just aren't there. Unless you have a huge name, like Mark Miller or something, uh, mm -hmm. they're not IDW or Dark Horse. They're not going to buy your comic because because uh, you don't have a following. If you don't have a following, you're you're not going to be able to get it out there. The idea itself is not enough, unless you do it independently and know how to rev up that uh, publicity machine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, in that vein, uh, what are the to you, what are the best and worst things about the current comics industry? Um, the comics market has not grown in 30 years. Uh, and I think a lot of the blame falls on video games. We have a whole generation of kids here who simply don't read. And uh, I can't blame them. I don't play video games, but I've looked at them. And, and it's plain to me that the... Uh, entertainment for buck per buck that you get from a really engrossing video game um, greatly exceeds the entertainment per buck that you get from a five dollar comic which you can read in 15 minutes now a lot of people save comics because they love the art and there are iconic moments and you can always go back and read the comic over and over again but comics are not attracting new readers uh, I think that the subject matter of a lot of comics, especially at the big two, are, are turning people off as, mm -hmm. as writers and artists produce, uh, pursue particular agendas. And I, again, I have to emphasize that the writer's number one obligation that overshadows all else is to entertain. You must entertain or you're not going to get your, your readers to follow along. Uh, that said, there, there are bright spots all over. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question from a listener, Rob Walton. He said, ask Mike which characters, if any, he'd feel drawn to write in a perfect world. 
where he was free editorially to write as he wished, even if the characters were his own. Well, I always prefer my own characters, uh, Nexus and Badger and Josh Pratt and some others. So I'm creating uh, any real creator. When I was younger, I would geek out at the opportunity of writing this or that. I always wanted to write Master Kung Fu. But uh, now that I have my own characters, like Q-Ball, we just put out Q-Ball. It's been picked up by Antarctic. Have you seen Q-Ball? No, I haven't. Oh, I'll send you a copy of that, too. That's uh, a very exciting little independent. It's a martial arts espionage thriller. I have an explosive new artist in in Barry McLean, uh, and uh, I'm stoked for that. And there's some other stuff that's that's just in the talking stage now, but uh, I'm pretty confident about it, you know, because a writer generates ideas. I got all these ideas. If I look back and I don't like the idea, I'm not going to resurrect that. I'm always looking for the new idea. I'm always striving for perfection. So I'm working on a whole bunch of stuff, but mostly I would prefer to work on my own characters. Okay. Um, so you meant you uh, told us what's coming from you novel wise, but uh, comics wise, what what's coming from you next? Well, the next two novels in the Josh Pratt series, which will be out in a couple of months, are Buffalo Hump and Bloodline. Uh, and L- okay. Liberty Island Press is also publishing my dog novel called Disco. It's a, a story for the whole family. It's about a boy who adopts a mongrel puppy and trains it to be world disc dog champion. It's a complete departure from everything else I've read. Uh, And I'm very proud of that and very happy about it. I also recently finished a Destroyer novel, and I'm not sure when that's going to come out, but I'm pretty proud of that, too. It's called Groovers. Uh, And I'm already making notes on my eighth Josh Pratt novel. I'm probably going to be busy with Josh Pratt, hopefully too uh, far into the future, uh, but I also have outlines for other novels I'm entertaining, including a big historical novel. I don't know when I'll ever get to it. Um, we'll see what happens with Josh Pratt. Hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and you have a website you can send people to here? BloodyRedBaron.net. Hmm. Okay, good. BloodyRedBaron.net. I'm Michael A. Barron on Facebook, and on Twitter I'm at BloodyRedBaron. Okay, sounds good. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Tim. Once again, Mike's website is bloodyredbaron.net. Here at deconstructingcomics.com, we produce Deconstructing Comics, Critiquing Comics, and To the Bat Poles. If you like our shows and want to support them, pledge at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Also, please help us get noticed by reviewing us on Apple or any other podcast source. Tell the world why you enjoy Deconstructing Comics. Another way to show your appreciation is simply to write to us. Email us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com or contact us through social media. Find all the links on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com. We're also on the Comics Podcast Network at comicspodcasts.com and on Comic-Con.com, where our new episodes usually go up on the Friday before they appear in our feed. Our theme is from bensound.com. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and Mulele and I will critique it on our spin-off podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. We're on summer vacation now, but we'll be back in mid-August, so send in your comic now. This coming Thursday on To The Bat Poles, Al from the Married With Children podcast joins us to talk about everybody's favorite Season 3 episode, Surf's Up, Joker's Under. Also, Paul announces the winner of his contest for the best alternate lyrics for the Batgirl theme. Listen to To The Bat Poles in its own podcast feed on Apple Podcasts or other podcast apps or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. Then next week, Kumar and Dana discuss two books by Ed Pisker, Hip Hop Family Tree and X-Men Grand Design. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>